Yes, hello everybody. Welcome to the live stream. I appreciate everyone here. We're going to talk about how to gain muscle and lose fat at the same time. And I kind of geared this presentation to people 40 and over, maybe a little bit leaning towards men, but I think women can really benefit this from as well. I know some people say it's really hard to do the same thing at the same time. I'm going to break it all down with a bunch of slides. Hey, Jeff, thanks for showing up. I'm also going to try the same thing as I did last time. I'm going to try to go live on Instagram too. Hey everybody on Instagram, welcome to the live stream. We're gonna be talking about how to put on muscle and lose fat at the same time if you're 40 or over. We're gonna to gear it towards 40 and over. And if you wanna see this presentation with all the slides, I have a whole bunch of slides, jump over to YouTube, look me up, Mike Cola. Hey Mike, how you doing? Jump over to YouTube, look me up, Mike Cola, or even Facebook, Mike Cola Fitness, if you wanna check out all the slides. Hey Chris. I'm gonna, hey Chris, thanks for showing up. I appreciate it, good morning to you as well. I hope everything, I hope everyone is having a great day and be sure to get out and get you walking today. I definitely will. I, it's interesting because when I, when I was preparing this slide this morning, you know how I like to um, like jumpstart my circadian rhythm. I had my espresso outside today when I was doing the slide. It was hard to see, but I did it all, which is really, really great. great. And, I, and I like this presentation today. I got a lot of detailed slides on some workouts you can do, but I wanna set it up in a good way because some people say you really can't gain muscle and lose fat at the same time, but I think you can, especially if you're not in like incredible top shape. But I'll, you'll see what I'm talking about in the um, in the next slide. And once again, everyone on Instagram, if you want to check out the slides, jump over to YouTube and check me out on YouTube. Let's see. And I'm pulling in everyone's comments. Just see, hey Mike, um, and everyone, Mo from the Netherlands. Hey, cool. Thanks, the Netherlands. That's really good. It's so cool. Oh, everyone is from all over the world, which is so, so exciting. Okay, so this is Jeff. I played tennis twice this week in 100 degree weather. Wow. <laughs> That's pretty cool, Jeff. I know, actually, we, we, the weather's been horrible in New York, though. I hate it. It's been um, so, so, uh, it's been rainy and cloudy. We had two weeks of rain and clouds, which was you know, kind of crummy. I, I took my walks on most of the days anyway, but I also have a treadmill. Obviously, I have my gym too. Okay, so let's jump into it. Okay, so the title of this is How to Gain Muscle and Lose Fat at the Same Time if You're Over the Age if you're over the age of 40. And this is what I'm gonna talk about. And some people think it's really hard to do, but it really has a lot to do with where you're coming from. Like for example, if you're in great shape, if you're like sub 10% body fat and you've been working out for years, it's really a hard thing to do because you're already in great shape. And I always think the general rule is you wanna be in a positive energy balance. That means you wanna be eating more calories than you're burning, right? To put on muscle. And to lose body fat, you wanna be, or lose weight, you wanna be in a negative energy balance. So if you're already lean and in amazing shape, it is kind of a hard thing to do. And what I would probably do is just cycle. You know, like if you're really lean and you're in great shape and you wanna gain muscle, you're gonna to have to eat more, get into a positive energy balance, maybe do that for eight weeks, maybe gain a teeny bit of body fat, and then maybe cut down. But this is more for the regular 40-year-old guy or gal. <laughs> you know, so for example, if you're coming from a place where, you, where you're new to working out, you can definitely do it because you're gonna have such a great response to the resistance training, you're gonna put on muscle. If you never worked, did resistance training before, or, or if say you're 40 years old, maybe you did it as a kid, you haven't done it in a long time, you'll be able to put on muscle and burn your body at the same time, I think, no question about it. Also, if you're really detrained, like I said, if you've been in, if you were in good shape, you know, maybe in your 20s and 30s, and then you started working, the kids, you know, you get married, you get, get into relationships, whatever, you get really, really busy, you get out of shape, and then you start working out again, I think then it's also, that scenario is also a good scenario where you can put on muscle and burn body fat at the same time. And I think the third way where you can definitely do it, it's funny, I got a lot of lights on today. I feel like I'm sweating from all these lights. And another person that, that can work really well for is if you're really overweight. Like if you're like 40, 50 pounds overweight, you have so much excess energy, <laughs> you know, stored in those fat cells, then you can definitely you know, go into a mild calorie deficit and start working out. You can burn some body fat and put on muscle at the same time. So I think for most people, for like 80, 90% of the people who aren't in an amazing shape and really lean, you definitely can put on muscle and um, burn fat at the same time. And once again, I don't wanna keep on saying this and drive everyone on YouTube crazy, but if you're watching me on, in, on, on Instagram, and I really appreciate it, and you wanna see all my slides, I do these slides every single Sunday, I got like eight or nine slides. Jump over to YouTube, you know, look me up, Mike Cola, I'll be right there. 
or you can look me up Mike Kohler Fitness on Facebook and you can also um, see the slides there. So I go live, I can't go live on Instagram yet and I don't have the technology to do that with all the other ones. Okay, so let's go over the general diet plan you know, that, that I like for putting on muscle and burning fat at the same time. First of all, I probably would want everyone in, in like just somewhat either maintenance calories or small calorie deficit. And let me explain what I mean. That maintenance calories is that you're, you're at equilibrium, right? You're eating just the right amount of calories where you're not gaining or losing. And then by just going into a small calorie deficit, you're going to burn some body fat. So that's kind of, I think, the niche, kind of like the sweet spot of where you want to be when you want to burn body fat and put on muscle at the same time because you need the protein, you need the energy, you need the calories to really put on muscle. So you can't be too aggressive with the calorie deficit. Hey, hey, 52, that's good. Thanks for showing up. And Harriet's here again. Don't you know where you don't you know you, you don't you know you were on today? Oh, didn't know I was on today. Yeah, you know, I, I thought I put uh, uh, announcements out. I kind of did it late though, maybe 10 o'clock. I got done making the slides, so kind of a late announcement that I was going to go live. But I'm going to try to do this every single Sunday. And also, if you have any questions on Instagram, ask your questions too. It'll be a lot of fun. Okay, so you want to you wanna do a couple things. First of all, let's talk about the diet. I think what I would consider to be like somewhat of just like a mild calorie deficit is maybe around 12, 13 times your body weight. And then to be at maintenance calories, you want to be at 15 times your body weight. Typically, my weight loss calorie formula when you're just looking like the burned body fat and like maintain muscle mass would be 10 times your body weight. So you don't want to be that aggressive because you want a lot of energy to hit the gym, to do your cardio, to do your working out. So being like a mild calorie deficit, you can use one of those, um, you know, those weight loss calculators that you find online. But I think a general rule is you multiply your body weight by 12, maybe 13. That'll put you in, in, in like a small calorie deficit and even 15 times your body weight, which is maintenance calories. I think you can do really well. You know, where, where, you know, when it comes to putting on muscle and burning some body fat, you know, you want to be a little bit heavier on the protein. I think you want to go with that classic like bodybuilding formula of one gram of protein per pound of body weight, unless you got a lot of weight to lose. Like I'm saying, if you're 300 pounds and you want to weigh 200, I wouldn't want you eating 300 grams of protein. Then you can go with, you can go with your goal weight. If you're 300, you want to weigh 200, eat 200 grams of protein a day and complete protein, all those non-essential amino acids. You know, I'm an animal guy, chicken, fish, meat, eggs, Greek yogurt, you know, vegetables, also the protein as well. But you got to keep your protein up. And when it comes to the fats, don't drive yourself crazy with the fats. Don't go really low fat. Don't go really high fat. Just make, you know, eat your fats from the natural food you're eating, like your eggs and, and your red meat and your salmon and your avocados, things like that. And just keep an eye on fat when it comes to calories because you don't want to go too high on your calories. So let's say, let's just give an example. Let's say you're 200 pounds, right? 10 times your body weight would be 2,000. 12 times your body weight, what would that be? 200, um, like 2,400 calories. You eat like 2,400 calories a day. You're in a little bit of a calorie deficit, but you're still eating a lot of protein, a reasonable amount of carbs, one to 200 grams of carbs, so you got enough energy to work out. Carbs come in because you want to, uh, just enough energy to work out. You don't necessarily want to do a fat adapted type thing, I don't think, You know, when, when you really want to hit the gym pretty hard. Okay, so let's go over. Let me see, any other questions? Hey, Chris, uh, Chris is giving me the fist. Thanks a lot, Chris. I appreciate it. You know what, guys, too? I think I'm going to, I'll keep this Instagram going a little bit longer, but I don't know if you can really appreciate what I'm doing on Instagram. Jump over to YouTube. We'll keep it going for a little bit more. Hey, Helene, um, I'm telling everyone I'm over on YouTube with the slides if you want to check it out. Because I feel like it's hard for me to look at both things at the same time. But let's go over this. Let's go over this resistance training workout plan. Okay, so the main thing, and I based this on like an eight week cycle, and I kept in mind that everyone is a little bit on the middle-aged or older because I want it to be easy on your joints, easy on your connective tissue. I want you to kind of ease into it, okay? I'm gonna end the Instagram, but I appreciate everybody showing up. Jump over to YouTube, okay, if you wanna watch this or my call of fitness. So take care, Instagram. I really appreciate you showing up, okay? Yeah, I can focus on it till Monday. It's so distracting to me to, to look at both things at the same time. So I just want to do that. I'm, it seems like I'm getting a lot of people following me on Instagram, so I don't want to leave them out. Okay, so let's go over this resistance training workout plan. The main thing over these eight weeks is that whatever you start, whatever your starting point is, you have to use progressive resistance. People call it like progressive overload. At the end of this eight week cycle, you have to be stronger. Or you have to be, it's gonna be, it's, it's the same thing really. You have to be working harder when you're doing your resistance training. Like for example, if you can do 20 push-ups day one, 
eight weeks down the road, you want to be able to do 30 push-ups. That's just a basic example. You just want to, you want to make it a little bit harder every single week. That's what's going to put on the muscle. And if you keep your calories in line, right, and you're eating enough protein, and since you're increasing the intensity of your workouts, you should be able to reduce body fat at the same time as putting on muscle. So that's the general concept of this whole thing, progressive overload. At the end of the eight week cycle, you have to be stronger and or your resistance training workouts have to be harder. That's the key to the whole thing and you can creep along. We're just talking 5% stronger, 5% harder every week. But don't think that doing more is necessarily harder. Meaning that I'm somewhat of a minimalist and you're gonna see when we go through how I break down the resistance training. I'd rather you think more intensity like doing like a harder set, you know what I mean? As opposed to say, okay, I'm, do, I'm doing three sets of bench pressing, let me do six sets. I don't want you to think like that. I'd rather you say, within those three sets, I'm gonna do like one really hard work set my last set and really go for it, get really close to a momentary muscle failure. I'd rather you think like that. In my opinion, that, that'll produce a better response to put muscle on. Yes, there is a correlation with the amount of volume that you do, which we're gonna talk about here, and you can increase volume, but think more about working harder. That's the key to the whole thing. Here's Sarah, Sarah, can this work on 65 yards? Absolutely. I almost was gonna do 15 over, you know, but I said like, I said I was going for 40 over, no doubt, for sure. And I kept in mind, you know, I'm 60, this is, I do this type of thing constantly, I'll be turning 61, at the end of the summer, so Sarah, this can definitely be good for you, 100%, okay? So I designed it with three training sessions per week when it comes to resistance training. And how it's gonna work is I want you to hit each body part twice. But one day, you're gonna do, if you're looking at the slide, you're gonna do a full body split. Let me slide this over to you. I'm gonna make these slides a little big if you're watching this on your phone. There we go, I'm gonna make the slide a lot bigger so you can really see it, okay? Okay, so one day you're gonna do full body. Let's just assume that's um, let's assume that's a Monday. So Monday you're gonna train your whole body in one session under 60 minutes. Don't make these workouts too long. Like I'm saying, I'd rather you think intensity, working harder as opposed to longer. 60 minutes is more than enough to train your whole body. But then the other two days a week you're gonna do split routine. So for example, you want to rest. You know, you create the response working out Monday. You want to rest. You take a day off Tuesday. You'll see you'll be doing your cardio say on Tuesday. But then Wednesday, say you would do upper body, you take Thursday off, and then Friday you would do lower body. And on the days when you do a split routine, you'll do a little bit more volume. Meaning that since you only have, since you have that same 60 minutes, when you train full body, I'm gonna break these workouts down for you, you may only be doing like a couple sets of bench, a couple sets of push-ups, then you go right to your back, then you go to your chest, shoulders, and arms. When it comes to a split routine, you can do a little bit more volume, okay? And it seems like from the new research, and I always felt this way too, you wanna to do about 10 to 15 total sets per body part per week. But you have to keep in mind that for example, when you're training your chest, that you're doing a push up or you're doing a bench press, it's a compound movement. You are working your chest, but you're also working your shoulders, you're working your triceps, like when you're training your back, when you're doing rows and like pull ups, besides working your back, your lats, you're working your bicep, you're working your forearm. So most of the volume is gonna come from those big compound movements. So when you're working your chest, your back, you, you have to do less volume when it comes to your shoulders and arms because you're already training your shoulders and arms when you're doing your chest and back. So just keep that in mind too. So maybe you might be doing six, seven sets of chest. When it comes to your arms, you may only do a couple sets because you, your arms are already fatigued. They already had a good workout. Okay, but I'm gonna break this all down for you when we get to the workouts, you'll, you'll understand it better. But that's so we're gonna be about 10, 15 total sets per week when it comes to the, um, I'm, I'm just gonna put this, this, this phone back onto YouTube in case I miss a comment. Okay, and, and this is when it comes to people like 40 and over. This is where I would change. You know, when I was younger, I would do, I would power lift, I would do triples, triples meaning only three reps, I would lift very, very heavy weights. Okay, you wanna lift, you wanna lift moderate, moderately heavy weights, but mostly I think medium to light weights by keeping the repetitions high. I like it to be in that 12 to 20 rep range. That per now, in my opinion, I think this has been proven now in the research that any rep range can put on muscle. Now many years, years ago people say, oh no, you know, to put on muscle, you gotta be in that eight to 12 rep range. You can do 30 reps and put on muscle. You can do one rep and put on muscle. In my opinion, the higher the repetitions, the safer it becomes because you're just dealing with less weight. 
you're dealing with lighter weight. And most people hurt themselves lifting weights. Not necessarily doing the actual movement of lifting the weights is grabbing like a heavy, grabbing 75 five pound dumbbells, walking, you know, to the bench and they trip, and you know, or something bizarre happens. You, know, you, you can get hurt in the gym, you can. So if you're just living your life more with light or moderate weights, the risk of getting hurt right there is just dramatically reduced. Besides, I find that when you're doing higher repetitions like that 12 to 20 reps, the first few repetitions are somewhat warm-up repetitions for when the weight gets heavier. And the neural fatigue is really good when you're doing high repetitions. Neural fatigue means like your central nervous system. When you do higher reps, it creates a great response in my opinion. I think when you're 40 or older, I wouldn't go much below. I wouldn't go below eight reps. I wouldn't do, unless you're into powerlifting, that's a different thing. We're talking general fitness, putting on muscle here. You know, I, would, I wouldn't go below 12, eight reps, but I like that 12 to 20 rep range. I like a relatively slow rep cadence, meaning that you're gonna lift the weight positively, like one 1,000, two 1,000, lower the, lower the weight for like a three second rep. This is like that Arthur Jones concept. I don't know if you followed Arthur Jones. That's the first gym I ever joined when I was like 15 years old was, was an Arthur Jones gym. If you're anywhere near my age, you'll probably remember Nautilus Equipment, Arthur Jones. You know, he believed in, in doing, you know, one set to three. He was like the original guy for that high intensity training. So a lot of my principles are still, are still with him. I think he was right about so many things. So we're gonna stay in the relatively high rep range. We're gonna move the weight relatively slowly, right? Most people get hurt when they're actually doing the movement at the point of transformation, meaning that let's say you're doing a squat when you like bounce on the bottom or you're doing a bench press and you're letting it bounce off your chest. I mean, that's when people get hurt. If, you, if you're doing slow controlled repetitions at a relatively slow rep cadence, for example, say you're lowering a bench, if you, if you decelerate and slow down right before you start to explode up, you're gonna have a much less chance of hurting yourself as opposed to blasting out these reps. Not that a fast rep cadence can't, can't produce results, it can, but we're talking, we're a little bit older now, we're 40 and up, we, we don't wanna hurt our joints, we wanna control the weight. And whenever you're not sure whether you can handle the weight, don't lift the weight. You wanna be in control of the weight, you want those last couple of repetitions to be pretty hard. But you wanna keep a, there's a new phrase now, I don't know how it's been around for a while, I, I guess it's called reps in reserve. Meaning that if you can do, say you can bench press 200 pounds 15 times and, and then you go right to muscle failure, you don't really wanna go right to muscle failure because it gets a little risky. Keep a rep or two in reserve. And that's still really hard. Meaning that if you can do 15 all out, do 13 reps, something like that, right? Maybe 14 reps, keep a rep or two in reserve. You're gonna do just as well. You're not gonna hurt yourself. You're gonna make great, great progress. That's what I mean, perform one hard set close to failure. And this is what I mean by one hard set. I like the term one hard work set. I mean, that let's say you're doing three sets. We use the bench press because everyone knows what a bench press is. Let's say you're doing three sets of bench press, right? First you, and, and you can, and you can bench like that 200 pounds, say 15 times. Okay. The first set, they call it like progressive resistance and you're going to pyramid up. The first set, put a lighter weight on there, put 135. And I'm pulling these numbers out of my head because when you put an Olympic bar, an Olympic bar weighs 45 pounds. And obviously, Sarah, if you're a gallon, you're 65, you could be doing this literally with three pound dumbbells. So don't, I'm just giving you examples. An Olympic bar is 45 pounds. You throw 45s on this 135. You slowly do, you know, 15, 20 repetitions. You want to bring blood. You want neurologically, you want to pattern the motion. You're going to be stronger, right? You give it maybe 50% effort. Second set, maybe you go 70% 70, 70 effort. And then you do one hard work set where you go all, you know, all out, where you're going a rep in reserve. That's what I mean by one hard work set. And that's what I like. And that's really all you need, in my opinion. I know a little bit more volume, you know, can pump up the muscle. Like, and like I said before, there's three basic ways in which you put on muscle. One is, one, is, one is called muscle tension. That means you lift weights, right? You create tension, you lift heavy weights, you get bigger, stronger. That's how you put on muscle. The other one is muscle damage. You make those little microscopic tears in the muscle. Like you're breaking the muscle down, it repairs itself. And then the third way is that metabolic stress where you pump the muscle up. That's what I like when you get older. A combination of that muscle tension with that metabolic stress where you pump the muscle up and the metabolites build up. Like you train for the burn, which is great. Okay, and the other thing I really like is this keep continuous tension on the muscle. And this is what I mean by that. 
let's once again let's use the bench press as an example let's say you're bench, bench pressing don't lock out and rest on top first of all when you're locking out it, it's almost like a rest plus it could be a little stressful right on the joints to just lock your joints out you can go full extension but then come right back down like don't find places to rest within the repetition okay like some people i feel when i watch them lift weights i look at them lifting weights they're doing one rep over and over and over again like they do a curl and then they like you know they let the they let the weight rest on their thighs and they're like starting all over again now you want that metabolic stress you want those metabolites to build up you want to close the mu muscle down right you want to make a light weight feel heavy think like that the opposite of a bodybuilder about i mean the opposite of a power lift the power lift they want to make a heavy weight feel light like by using great technique and using the momentum and speed and just throwing the weight over your head you want to think differently you want to make a light weight feel really heavy by keeping continuous tension on the muscle like once you start a set don't let the tension come off your muscles so if, when you're doing a curl right even if you're going to just about full extension, don't let it rest on your thighs for half a second. Come right back up again. And there's also points within repetition. This gets, can get a little complex maybe for this live stream, but there's always points when you're doing a rep, like when you're working out, especially with free weights where the weight is heavier or lighter. You can probably understand, let me stand up for a second. You probably understand a bicep curl a little bit. Like if, if I'm holding a dumbbell in my hand, right? And I'm curling it up. When my fist is the furthest away from my bicep, that's when the weight's the heaviest. But then when I come on top, the weight is balanced. There's almost no tension. So there's no tension here, and there's probably no tension at full extension. So what you want to do is that you don't want to hang out down here, and you don't want to hang out up here. You want to come right up and down. You can squeeze on top, but you want to keep continuous tension on the muscles. So if you're a gal like Sarah or something, you can take a five pound, three pound dumbbell, get a great pump in the bicep, tricep, or your body by keeping that continuous tension on the muscle. And that would be the biggest difference I think of when you're like over 40, or whether you're like in your 20s, or maybe even in your 30s where you do lockout type training, you're looking to lift, lift maximum weight, maybe you're doing some power lifting mixed in with your bodybuilding resistance training. I mean, you want to take care of your joints and you can get an incredible workout with relatively lightweight. So I even love that I, I talk about, I, I, I didn't do it for this presentation, but I also love that blood flow restriction training. I love that, which you could use extremely lightweight and close the muscle down. I think, I think Nicholas is here. Let me see, let me, I think Nicholas got a couple of questions. Okay, hey Mike, do you absolutely need to hit your one gram protein per pound of body weight every single day to gain muscle what if you miss one day? You do don't, Nicholas. And in your case, I know you're a younger guy. I I went with one gram per pound here because it was kind of one of those one of these eight week programs where I really want people to put on muscle and lose body fat when you're over forty. And first of all, when you're over forty, you need more protein, and it's just harder. <laughs> yeah, hormonally, everything is a little bit harder. In your case, Nicholas, I know you're a young guy. I think you're like seventeen, eighteen now. I don't even think you have to go one gram. You can go less and you can miss a day here or there. Absolutely. With, you don't have to go that high. Okay. Okay. I left my comment yesterday about B12 being giving me acne. I think it was the problem as my acne is already fading and it's only, oh, that's great. Yeah. I think I responded to the comment by saying, yeah, I would just stop taking it and see how you respond. So I'm assuming you did that. You stopped taking it and you feel like your acne is getting a little better. And sometimes Nicholas too. You know, with the with all these supplements and these vitamins, Nicholas asked a question on the YouTube channel yesterday, saying that he started taking B12. I think even a multi, some type of supplement, and he felt like it was giving him acne. Sometimes you don't even know it's the B12 because they put so many other other things these these supplement companies in these supplements. It's hard to even know really know like what you're getting. It could have been a filler. It could have been something else in the supplement besides the B12 that was causing you acne. So I'm glad you stopped. I don't think necessarily think you need it if you're getting good protein, you're eating, you know, I know you're eating animal protein, you should be fine with B12. And then my favorite supplement companies, which I think, which I've mentioned, which I, I think they really are one of the best ones. Thorn is a really good one. Whenever they get third party tested, they do incredibly well. New Chapter, I like Garden of Life. Those are like the premier, in my opinion, supplement companies who are constantly being tested by third parties 
and it, it, it gets them um, like really good good reports. Like whatever they say they're putting in is really in there. Mm. Let's see, okay, what's that image? Okay, okay, this is another thing too. When you're over 40, I know it's a little debatable, this nutrient timing thing. I lived and died by it, meaning that in my 20s and 30s and based on John Levy's book, Nutrient Timing, which I always bring up even though it's a book that's like 25 years old, you know, I always took in like protein and carbs before, you know, intra workout and right after. And high in leucine, you know, the branch chain amino acids that, like one of the branch chain aminos and essential aminos that is probably the most important amino for put, putting on muscle. Since we're like kind of trying to do two things at the same time here, like put on muscle and lose body fat at the same time, even though the new researchers are saying that it's more important just to take in protein within your 24 hour cycle, it's not necessarily as important to take it in pre, intra, and post, I still think you should. I would definitely do, whenever you're doing your resistance training, I would do a pre-workout protein shake, drink half of it, do like 25 grams of a whey protein isolate. I have another slide on this too later on. You know, with some like L-citrulline maybe, you know, with a little creatine, I probably would take creatine during this process too, maybe five grams a day. Drink half of it, maybe a half hour before your workout, and then drink the other half like during and after, just to make sure you're fueling your muscle with that protein for protein synthesis. Because we're trying to like, you know, thread the needle here by putting on muscle and losing fat at the same time. Some people feel you can't do it, but I do think you can. Like I said, as long as you're not in already like amazing shape, like bodybuilder type shape. Okay, so let's go over an example of what like a full body workout would look like. Okay, and, and I'm still, um, an old school, like simple. I don't like these fancy, you know, balancing -y, you know, type workouts. I still like your basic push, pull, squat, lunge. I think there's nothing better you can do. These are proven exercises that have been around for decades and decades. The old time bodybuilders from Steve Reeves, right? You know, Hercules to, you know, Frank Zane to even these modern guys. I don't even know the names of all the new bodybuilders nowadays. They're still doing all these movements. I know it's great. I, I do talk about mobility movement. I think that's incredible to do to lubricate your joints and to do those flows and to be able to move. And, and I still want you to do that as a cool down. But you still, when it comes to putting on muscle, you want to do these basic movements. So let's get, go through just a typical example. And also, guys, once again, give me a thumbs up on, on YouTube if you're watching this there. Whatever. Share this video. Let's see if we can get more people in the room who can like benefit from this. And also, I, I want to talk about too. I, I, I made a community post saying that I, I just hit two million views on YouTube, which I'm pretty excited about. I know other people get two million views on one video, but it took me a few years to get here, so I'm excited that I hit two million views. Hopefully, everything will start taking off, which will be really, really exciting. And I am working on this really intense group coaching program once again. It's not ready yet. It's still going to take me a few more weeks, but I'm really excited about that too. Okay, so let's um, get into this. So you always want to warm up. And what do you mean by warm up? It just, warm up is really exactly what it sounds like. You're warming your body up. You're increasing your core body temperature. You know, then the muscles automatically become more elastic. You know, there's like, like, there's like fluid that are in your joints. It's confusing when you look at your joints. I mean, let, let me pull up my other camera, show you what I mean. Can you see the skeleton without me blocking? See the skeleton? Everyone thinks that, not everyone, a lot of people think that your joints are not encapsulated, but your joints are all encapsulated, meaning that there are fluids within your joints that, like the, the viscosity of the fluid is called synovia fluid. When you warm up, it changes. It's like your body becomes self-lubricating when you warm up. So it's so important to do a nice, um, a nice five minute warm up. And I like things like it, you can literally get on like a Versa climber, one of those Schwinn bikes. And I kind of geared this for more like a gym workout, but you could do it at home if you have the equipment. You could do jumping jacks, like Jack only invented the jumping jack. You could do jumping jacks. Don't do something that flexes the spine aggressively. Like I wouldn't want you to do burpees at over the age of 40. You know, like a burpee type thing is a warm up. It's too aggressive on the spine and everything. Now, not that burpees are necessarily bad, but you, you, you're not warmed up yet. You know, so don't like flex and bend. I wouldn't like aggressively touch my toes and arch my back. I would kind of keep the spine in a, in a nice neutral position. That's why you can get on the bicycle. You can do jumping jacks, right? You can get on the, the elliptical. You can understand master. You know, you want to warm yourself up. Slowly increase your body temperature. Let me see. I think we got a few comments. Oh, hey, thanks, Jeff. Je Jeff's congratulating me on the 2 million views. Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate it. Oh, congrats, Mike Nicholas, for giving me a congratulation, too. 
Blue sky. Good afternoon. Great. Good topic. Oh, thanks. I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you like it. That's great. Juicy Mike. Oh, this is this is uh, uh, juicy, but it's really Nicholas. Mike, when am I? What? Okay, Mike. When I'm aiming to put on muscle, should I minimize cardio? I think you should to some degree. We're gonna talk about that. In your case, Nicholas is just. I keep on saying you're young. I mean, your hormones are so good. You're such at a, at a great age to put on muscle. I probably was. I think you can still do some you know some steady state or maybe even a little a little hit cardio but for this particular program for people 40 and over when i get to the cardio you see this in a couple of slides i just want people walking because i don't want them breaking down any muscle and overdoing it because the workout is pretty challenging this eight week cycle where you're progressively making things harder so when it comes to the people 40 and over which i kind of had this plan in mind for i'm just going to have them walking and not even too aggressively, just a comfortable pace walking every morning, 45 minutes to an hour, just to burn some body fat and then let the muscle grow. You know what I mean? Hey, Alexandra's here. Hey, thanks for showing up, Alexandra. Let's see what she said. Hey, Mike. Do you th okay? Hey, Mike. What do you think about the those Nautilus machines? Do you like them or do you prefer free weights? I like both. I love Nautilus machines. It's almost hard to find them. The thing about Nautilus machines was so good because first of all, Arthur Jones. I think he may have invented it at one of the originators of the CAM. See, a CAM is what I was talking about. When you're lifting free weights, you may have missed the first example, Alex. I don't know if you're here. When I was doing a bicep curl, you know, like I'm saying, when there's no tension here, but then when you get here, the weight's the heaviest, and then when you get on top, the weight gets lighter. Nautilus had a lima bean CAM, which actually, say you were doing a curl on a Nautilus machine, where the weight was the lightest, the distance from the cam was the greatest. I know this might be hard to follow, meaning that the cam was making the weight heavier when you were, when you were stronger and was making the weight lighter when you were weaker, which is ideal. So as opposed to curling, say, a dumbbell where there's a sticking point where, where the weight's the heaviest, the cams on the Nautilus equipment gave you that continuous resistance. When you were weaker, it made the weight lighter. When you were stronger, it made the weight heavier. And that's an advantage. I love machines. Plus, Nautilus was a big believer. Arthur Jones was a big believer in pre-exhaustion, which I love. Even though there has been some new research saying that it doesn't really work that well. It's not really what Arthur Jones thought, but I love pre-exhaustion. The whole concept of pre-exhaustion is like, say for example, you're you're doing like a, a lot pull down. You're working your back, right? <clears throat> There's always a weak link, right? Your biceps are much smaller and weaker than your back. So when you do a pull down or a chin up or like a lot pull down, it's generally your bicep that fatigues sooner. So what Arthur Jones did, he had these machines that was incredible. He had the machines where first you would do an exercise that just worked your back, your lat, without your bicep. So he had a machine that had a pullover. A pullover is an exercise where you push down with your elbows and you lift the weight. So you're training your back without training your bicep. So you pre-exhaust your lat, your back, and then in the same machine, you go right to like really hard and then you grab a lat pull down and now you do a lat pull down. So the concept was that when you're doing your lat pull down, your biceps are fresh and strong, your back is weak and tired. So you really can get a great pump in your back. I train like that in my own gym all the time. I even did some videos on this. If you go to my YouTube channel, you put in my cola pre-exhaustion, I'll show you exactly how I did it. Like I'll do a cable pullover before I'll do a lot pull down. But I'll do a cable fly before I do like a bench press. I love it. So I, so Alexandra, I think both are, are equally as good, the pros and cons to both, but the key is just, it just intensity. If you're working hard on machines, if you're working hard on free weights, you know, whenever you lift a, lift a free weight, it's less isolated, so you do train your whole body to some degree to pr pretty much no matter what you're doing. Whereas a machine, you're, you're seated, it's a little more isolated, but I love them both. I think they're both great. Let me see, I missed any other question? Okay, cool. Okay, so let's go. So we warmed up, right? We know what a warm up is. And I think you should go from biggest body parts to smallest. When you train full body, I probably would almost always start with legs. You could start with chest or back, but I think it's legs. It's the biggest muscle in your body, your glutes, right? Gluteus maximus, your butt muscle. So just typical, you do a couple of sets of squats or a couple of sets of leg presses, right? Maybe you do a warm up set of air squats. Then, you know, depending upon how aggressive you want to be, I. 
you know, when you get older, I would be a little cautious still with loading your spine with heavy weight on the squat. I almost rather people just do like dumbbell, dumbbell squats, you know, you hold dumbbells in your hands. You can, you know, if you're a real strong guy, a guy, you get up to 7,500 pound dumbbells even. Or you use the hex bar, you know, they do your dumbbell squats, kind of like a deadlift squat, like press, and same concept, warm up, like one or two hard work sets. It's really one good hard work set. When it comes to these big compound movements, you might have to like, it, it, let's say you can squat 225. You don't want to just throw 225 pounds on your back, right? You want to do 135, maybe you want to squat the bar first, 45 pounds, do 135, do 185, and then you do your one work set at 225. Think like that. These big compound movements, you, you require more of a warm up than just training your arms, right? And RDLs are probably my favorite like deadlift type movement, remaining in deadlift. Look it up on YouTube if you know, don't know what they are. It's, it, it's a little easier, I think, on the lower back and on the knees and on the whole body of the RDLs. You know, works the hamstrings, hits the lats. I think it's a great move. You can do it with dumbbells. You know, it's hard for me in this presentation to pull all the videos in, but look these exercises up if you don't know how to do them. I have some of them on my YouTube channel, but there's so many good YouTube videos on how to, how to squat, how to leg press, how to do RDLs. But the bigger picture is from the other slide, meaning that use this concept in whatever you're doing. 10, 10 to 15 total sets per week, 12, 12 to 12 reps, slow rep cadence, continuous tension on the muscle, one hard work set. That's almost more important than the actual exercise prescription that I'm giving you here. It's more the concept of the whole workout, one full body day, take a day, you know, upper body, lower body split, Wednesday, Friday. But I wanted to give you some, some, some typical examples. Okay, so we... You know, you do your squats, a couple sets, one hard work set, RDL, one hard work set, maybe one warm up, one hard work set. And as you go through the workout, you're already warmed up. Like when you get to arms, you don't have to warm up because you already trained your biceps when you were training your back. So keep that in mind too. You can go right to a hard set of curls, which will save time because you want to do this workout in under 60 minutes, right? Then I, you got to train your calves. Just do a couple sets, a nice, you know, get a nice burn in your calves. Then you, I would go either chest or back first. So you, say you do a couple sets a lot pull down, one warm up set, one really good hard set a lot pull downs or pull ups. Hard to do pull ups for a lot of people in your 40s. You may have to use those bands. That's why I like a lot pull down at the gym. Then you want to do a, some type of rowing movement. These are all just classic movements like a seated row. Same thing. So a couple sets a lot pull downs, a couple sets of seated rows. You can do them with the machine or you can do them with dumbbells. Doesn't make a difference. Then we're going, now we're going to the, uh, this, the, this is that hybrid move. We're going to go a cable crossover or dumbbell fly. You know, you can do the dumbbell flies. You can do your cable crossover for your chest. Then you're doing um, your bench press and push-ups. You know, it's really just your classic chest back routine. But just keep in mind, one warm-up set, one hard work set. That's the key to the whole thing. Then we're doing shoulders, dumbbell shoulder presses, dumbbell, um, it's, 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 it's a, okay, I didn't mean to jump ahead. The fact that you did all those sets on chest and back, like I said earlier, your shoulders and your arms already got a good workout. So on the full body day, all you need is to go right to it. You do like one more set of shoulder presses, one hard set, that's it. You're done with shoulders. Same thing with bicep and triceps. You do one warm set of bicep curls, go one hard set. Same thing with um, lying tricep extension. You know, you already got your arms and shoulders already got a great workout before you even get to them. So you don't need to do much and you want to keep this workout on under uh, 60 minutes. Let's see, we got a couple of questions. Okay. Hey, thanks for showing. Hey, lying by the pool. <laughs> oh, that's great, Joe. Oh, that's great, oh, awesome. Well, I know a lot of people are going back to another buddy of mine who just went out to Southampton, which is great. I'm 57, I suffer from domes for long after workouts. You know, okay, DOMS stands for, people don't know, delayed onset muscle, delayed onset muscle soreness. So that's generally how it works. If you really suffer from um, DOMS, Melissa, I think you're probably doing it, you're probably training too hard. Meaning that if you're doing, if you, if you consistently stay sore for long periods of time, I just would ease it up. And you generally get sore from the eccentric part of the motion. Like certain exercises, is easier to get sore than others. Like if you're doing a dumbbell fly, where you're stretching the muscle like on the tension, or you're doing an RDL, you know, like when you're bending over, you're stretching your hamstrings. You know, you may want to ease up on those and don't look at soreness as necessarily an indicator that you got a good workout because you can get sore just from stretching. You like you can overstretch a muscle and you can make little microscopic tears and get sore. So I would ease up if you suffer from dones. Also, make sure you're eating enough protein, getting good recovery. Maybe you need just another day or two 
in between workouts if you like to work out hard. I mean, this is, you know, you literally can do just do two full body workouts a week and do incredibly well. You work out once every four days. You also may have to just eliminate the seven day week. Don't look at it like seven days. Look at it like 30 days. Like once every five days, you may want to do a resistance training workout. Everyone's different. You may need more recovery. You know, so don't don't get into this chronic soreness where you're just sore all the time. I would I would make some changes for sure. Okay, so like like I said, the dumbbell curl, bicep fl flies, and then you always want to do your core. You know, you could do it on your walking days, but I put it into the resistance training, and I like the basic stuff. I got videos all on this front plank, side plank, and then you do want to cool down with the mobility movement. I've got a few few videos on mobility movement. There were people that had just known for that. Go on YouTube, put in mobility movement, put in flows. There's another guy, some people call them animal flows, where you're just like sli slowly moving in all these positions. I think it's great when you get older, so, so good for you. And this is a big keynote. This is the key to this whole progressive resistance thing when you get older. Try to make um, the workout 5% harder e each week, meaning do an extra rep, throw a little bit more weights. You may want to get those plate mates, those plate mates also. Even if your gym doesn't have them, you may want to buy them yourself and bring them to the gym in your bag. Those plate mates, those plate mates, or these little magnet weights that are like half a pound each. See, I like gyms, like my gym, I always have like two and a half. I have seven and a half, I have 12 and a half, I have 17 and a half. I like those half weights, because you don't necessarily always have to jump five pounds, whatever you want to go up and weight. And if you have, and I also have these plate mates where you can stick them on the end. I can increase someone's weight by one pound. That's the key. Micro progression is the hardest thing to understand. I find, especially when you're older, is you just want to make things just a little bit. I was almost going to put two and a half percent. You can do make the workout two percent harder every week. I mean, that's the key. And then at the end of the eight weeks, you want to take a break. You want to recycle. You don't want to keep on going. You want to just like, okay, I achieved this eight weeks. Hopefully, I have a little bit more muscle on my body. My body fat's a little bit lower. Let me take a couple of weeks. Maybe, you know, just take it easy with the weights. Maybe just do some calisthenics for a couple of weeks. You know, go to mates and calories and then start this whole process up again. You know? And let me give you a couple. I don't want to keep on repeating this exercise, but this is like an idea of, oh, I lost my good camera. This is the idea of, an upper body split and this is what I mean the volume is going to be greater when you're only training upper body it's a little bit a little bit more bodybuilding that's why I like this workout so much like one day on a Monday you do full body so you're keeping the volume not that high but then the next time you train you're only doing half your body so obviously you can do more same thing you're going to warm for five minutes you do your jumping jacks your you know whatever you want your exercise back your elliptical you know I love the uh, Versa Climber which is great but see how I'm doing more volume? You're gonna do maybe a couple sets of push-ups. And, and how I gave you this time, I gave you antagonistic. This is a, I don't know if you would call this advanced, but like wh whenever you're pushing, right, you're doing a bench press, it's chest, shoulders, triceps. Whenever you're pulling back and biceps. So if you're gonna train your chest, like do all your chest exercises all at once, you're gonna have to rest more because you want your pushing muscle to recover. But you can train antagonistically if you want to save a little bit of time which I love so for example you go push pull you do like a set of push-ups you rest a minute then you do a set of pull-ups right and you can repeat that three times so you don't have to you know you can get a lot done same thing you can do bench press and then you can do bent over row or seated row set a bench press only rest 30 seconds seated row as opposed to resting a full two minutes to recover I love the antagonistic training right Dumbo pullover is kind of a hybrid. It's, it's, it's working your chest and back both. So it's a nice in-between movement to do. Maybe three sets of pullovers. Then same thing. Shoulder press, lateral raids, bicep curl, tricep extension. You can go back and forth. Same thing. Rolling planks. I like to stir the pot. You know, that's when you get on that exercise ball and you stir the pot. That's a classic Stu McGill exercise. I love it. It's a great exercise. I like non-movement exercises for the abs, for the so meaning that you're not necessarily flexing and extending your spine. You're always challenging the neutral position. Like, you know the wheel? You know, when you wheel out, like things like that, where the reason why the wheel works the abs is that when you extend with the wheel, your hip flexors are yanking on your lower back and trying to arch your back. It's your abs, it's your midsection that's stabilizing your whole torso so you don't hurt your back. So that's what I mean by non-movement. You know, that planks are like a non-movement exercise 
to train your core, like to train your stomach. So I love the non-movement, especially when you get older. You don't necessarily want to be flexing and extending your spine with, with a lot of weight or a lot of force. So, But I, a little bit of that's okay too. Like I, sometimes I'll do a couple of sets off the ball, you know, some type of an ab crunch off the ball, which I still do like that. It gives you a nice eccentric load on, on, on the abs. But most of my uh, core work for when you get over 40 is going to be non-movement. And this is also, this is a day where you have a little bit more time to do your mobility work. And you can just do mobility work for your upper body. Another guy you want to look up is Edie Portal. He's the movement specialist. He's like off the charts, just incredible stuff what he does but there's so many good i should have brought this there's a guy like i don't know if the husband and wife or boyfriend girlfriend they're from australia this gal is great ah she she, she moves so well you know uh, next time i do the live show I'll, I'll try to pull up her name she i follow her on instagram they have they move so well everything is really safe i love the mobility movement stuff so let me give you an idea of a lower body split which is really the same thing i'm pulling those same other exercises just doing more volume you warm up once again for example, you know, when, when you're doing a warm up for, for upper body, just make sure you're moving your shoulders and arms. That's why I love a Versa climber or, or the Airdyne bike or even maybe a rowing machine. And then when, you, when you're warming up for legs, make sure you're warming up your legs and your knees. Like, you know, you want to maybe use an exercise bike or elliptical, something like that. Like, I wouldn't necessarily think maybe, you know, like an exercise bike might be better than doing something like a jumping jack on the days that you want to warm up for legs. And just the same thing, dumbbell squats. On the full day, if you only did one or two sets, maybe here you do three sets. Now I added some lunges, increases the volume a little bit, the RDLs, the banded walks, calf raises, and then we do core rolling planks, abdominal rolls, and now you have more time to do your mobility work on your legs. So you want to hit the hips, hit the glutes. I love those scissors, you know, the 90-90. These are all things that if you look up mobility people, these classic moves they do. I do them, I love them. You know, it really keeps me feeling good and mobile. And you know, I always talk about my, all my injuries, my knees, my back, my neck. I, I'm able to stay at a pretty high level of fitness working around a bad knee like for example i won't do like heavy squats anymore but i you know i hold some dumbbells and do them i use the blood flow restriction bands a lot for my legs and this this knees over toes is really helping my knee i'm really excited about it. i think i can get my knee not where i really would like it to be but definitely a lot better i've been working backwards now for a year and a half i just started pulling the sled a little bit i um, started doing the other um it's, it's good. the guys it's called knees over, knees over toes atg started doing a lot of a lot of intense calf work tibialis anterior that's the muscle in front of the calf <clears throat> you know soleus when you bend the knee and do calf raises like donkey calf lifts and the patrick um the patrick step where you're letting your knee really go beyond your toe when you're doing these like one-legged lunges i'm doing it really really carefully conservatively of holding on making my body weight lighter but it's helping my knee i'm really excited about it and then um, let me see what other notes I made here. Okay, the most important thing, once again, I'm, I'm, I'm like a broken record here. The, um, the most important thing is to make the workouts progressively harder, like two and a half, five percent of the time every week. At the end of the eight weeks, you should be stronger or doing more repetition at the same at the same amount of weight from when you started, and that's what's going to put on muscle, right? And let's talk about the cardio now. The diet is going to help you lose the body fat, like we said, you know, twelve times your body weight maybe 15 times some days, but this is how I'd like you to do it when it comes to like the diet with the resistance training with the cardio. Let's say you're at maintenance calories. That means 15 times your body weight, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, when you're doing your resistance work. That means you have a lot of protein. You always want to get the protein up, but you have more carbs, you have more calories. They get a good workout to create a response. But then the other five days during the week, those are the days where you kind of want to go to the lower calories, maybe 12 times your body weight, to be in like a small, maybe two, 300 calorie calorie deficit. So you're trying to get like the best of both worlds. You're trying to eat more food when you're doing resistance training, you put on muscle, but at the same time, on the days when you're doing your cardio and you're in a in, in small calorie deficit, you're trying to burn some body fat. So you're trying to get the best of both worlds here. Some people like to split it up, but I think you can do it. So on the days when you're not doing your resistance training, like you know, I have this on the slide, you're gonna walk 45 to 60 minutes first thing in the morning on an empty stomach. I, mean, I just love this anyway. Even 30 minutes, you can also do 30 minutes in the morning, 30 minutes in the, in the afternoon, you can do 20 minutes three times a day. I like this because you're fasted, meaning your insulin levels are low, your blood sugar is low, you've been eating good, you have a good opportunity to burn some body fat you know, for 45 to 60 minutes. I know it's a little time consuming, but this is, a, this is an eight week 
plants are hopefully you're motivating your psyche, you know, so you really can get and do this. You know, you drink your cup, your black coffee, you drink your big bottle of mineral water like I normally do. <clears throat> and also on these days, I know a lot of people in here, uh, you guys follow me and you're my regulars and you, you've probably been fasting, but I kind of wrote this stuff for people maybe who weren't, weren't familiar with me. On the days when you're doing resistance training, I had in mind you're eating your three meals a day, you know, within a 12, 14 hour eating window. Because I really want you to get in good nutrition to build the muscle and the protein and the carbs and all that. But when you're doing your cardio workouts, you're doing your classic 16-8. You're skipping breakfast, right? You break your fast, 12 o'clock, last meal before 8. You're doing more my typical thing. Two mad plus a protein bar, protein shake to make sure you keep your protein up 12 times your body weight. So you're trying to get the, you know, you're threading the needle and you're trying to get like the best of both worlds. And you're not doing that high intensity cardio. You're not going to, believe me, you're still getting a cardiovascular benefit from doing those hard workouts for sure, the resistance training workouts. This is like base building, burning body fat. And you're, you're not going to fall apart. You're not going to lose too much via 2 max, you know, that maximal oxygen consumption by not doing those interval workouts for eight weeks. Maybe your next cycle. See, I like to think in <clears throat> those six, eight, 12 week cycles, this is like an eight week muscle building, fat burning cycle. Maybe you take two weeks off. And then your next eight weeks may be, okay, you know, I'm going to really go after my VO2 max. I'm going to maintain this muscle that I put on over these eight weeks. I don't want to lose it, but I may not necessarily put on any more muscle. But now for the next eight weeks, I'm going to really crank my uh, VO2 max. I'm going to do three high-intensity workouts, 20-minute workouts per week, really increase my VO2 max. <clears throat> you know, I'm still going to I'm gonna eat, like, you know, maintenance calories. And, you know, I, I like it's it's... It's nice to work in cycles. It keeps it fun, keeps it exciting. You always have a plan. You always have a goal. All right. So this this is the cardio workout, and you should only be eating twelve times your body weight. And I, I used right, and obviously I always liked my fitness pal. Unfortunately, I think we talked about this before. They start charging now for um, if you want, you know, a little bit more. It, 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 they took away some of the services of my fitness pal that were for free. You still can use it for free. I don't think you can use the barcode anymore for free. I think they want that five six bucks a month. But I've been using it for so long. I like my fitness pal. It's so easy to use and really good. Okay, and, and I made I have another slide here talking about. <clears throat> well, let me get let me get a little water. Talking about other things to keep in mind. I think Jeff's got a question. Here's Jeff. Okay. The next time I wake up early enough to walk 45 minutes before work will be the first time. Yeah, I know, Jeff. It's kind of hard, but I mean, I, I don't think this is necessarily. Um, you know, this eight week program was necessarily exactly for, you know, for you. you I, I know you know what you're doing and you're, like I said, you play tennis two, three times at a hundred degree heat, but you can take some of these concepts in general, just in, just to educate, you know, to help you with your workouts though, and resistance training in general, you can definitely, you do that three day split thing. Um, but I, but, but I hear you, I hear you. Here, there. So here are some other things to keep in mind. Okay, make sure you're getting at least eight hours of quality sleep a night. I know easier said than done, but so, so important, especially when you put on muscle. You know, when you're sleeping, if I would say when you're over 40, I know, especially men talk about testosterone, the singular best thing you probably can do to increase your testosterone is to make sure you get good quality sleep every single night. Keep cortisol levels under control and sleep. That's when your hormones take off. That's when you recover. That's when you build muscle. Pretty much when you're sleeping. Hey, Mo, let's see what you got. Okay, what causes a, don a donut of fat around belly button? And how can I, yeah, I, I know, Mo. I mean, it's just just everything I'm saying here. In your case, though, if you're not, if your main goal is not to necessarily like, you know, do all this weight training and put on a ton of as much muscle as you can, I would do more of what I, what I typically talk about, Mo. I would go... 10 times your body weight, whatever you weigh, let's say you weigh 190 pounds, eat 1,900 calories one day, <clears throat> Whatever. say you want to weigh 160, whatever your goal weight is, times that by 10, say it's 160, 1,900 calories one day, 1,600 calories the next, keep on repeating that, I'd eat an adequate amount of protein, I like 0 0.7 gram times your body weight, so one. I don't know what 190 times 0 0.7 is, I'm going to guess 130 grams of protein, something like that. You know, two mad plus a protein shake, 16 eight, fast 16 hours every day, only eat two meals plus a protein shake, a protein bar in, in between. I want you working out and walking too, but you wanna be a little bit probably more aggressive with your diet as opposed to going into all this um, resistant training stuff. I still want you to resistance, resistance train, I still want you to work out, 
but be more aggressive with your calorie restriction to get rid of that body fat. And, and I like a low carb diet too. I'm, I know you probably follow some of my stuff. Your goal is 74, yeah, so you're 70, 81, 60, one, so yeah, no. I mean, you can do it. I mean, you're not that far off your goal, actually. You just need a little bit to lose. You want to lose some body, you know, some belly fat. And I, I like a low carb approach too. So there's some other things to keep in mind too. Try to reduce stress as much as possible, obviously. You don't want cortisol to be, you know, the stress hormone to be going crazy within your body. Hard to burn body fat. Leads to insulin, insulin resistance, all that. Let's see what Jeff, Jeff's got. Yeah, I definitely need to do another dumbbell workout program in between summer and fall tennis season. I've had success in the past with testosterone advantage pro yeah I, I like it yeah that's i i know i, I know jeff because you're cycling with you're in tennis season now that's a great automatic cycle you know like you, you cut back on the weights a little bit get some great tennis in which is great for your vo2 max it's like you're doing intervals every time you're playing tennis like crazy and then once it's when tennis season ends you go into like a, mu a muscle building phase for 8 to 10 12 weeks i i love that plan i think it's great oh thanks mel i'm glad you found that helpful that's great cool Let's see what we got. you right. And also, this is another big one, too. You know, the fact that you're putting on muscle, hopefully, right, and you're burning body fat, don't necessarily go by the scale because you might be gaining muscle weight and you might be losing fat at the same time. So if the scale doesn't move, don't don't get discouraged. Go more by how clothes are fitting you. Go by, you know, waistline measurements. Go by how you look in the mirror, how you're looking and feeling because that gets really complicated. You could be putting on two, three pounds of muscle and losing um body fat at the same time and the scale can weigh the same obviously that's a common thing especially for people who've never worked out before who put on muscle pretty easily they've never done resistance training you can gain two three pounds of muscle kind of quick and people get all out of sorts say oh my god you know I, I i didn't lose any weight i've been working out for like eight weeks but meanwhile you lost five pounds of muscle i mean five pounds of body fat you gained three pounds of muscle or something you know so don't go by that don't go by the scale and I don't even know what I wrote here. Let's see. Your results will be based on your effort. Yeah, I keep on driving this home. Your results will be based on your effort, your diet, and your consistency, and your starting point, which is so true. Like, if you're already in amazing shape, you know, you, you, may, <laughs> you know, if you're 10% body fat and you've been working out like me for like 30 years, you, you know, it's kind of hard to do it at the same time. Not impossible, but just hard. Okay, let's see. What are your thoughts on working in kettlebells and yeah no i love kettlebell steve yeah, i think it's great you know I, I i got a whole bunch of my gym i would never I, you know i'm not it's i have to say that's not necessarily my expertise kettlebells even though i have them at my gym i do use them um you know the classic kettlebell swing i just do really simple things with it. i like to do some fun things with it too i, li I like um Stu mcgill M mcgill got me into this doing those um even walks like i'll hold a kettlebell in one hand you know reverse grip and I'll walk along the gym, quadrilumborum, great movement for quadrilumborum. I do some shoulder presses with the kettlebell because I like to always work my grip. Plus, I got a, a gangular cyst in my wrist. Hard for me to, if you ever notice me when I'm posting pictures of myself, you know, when I'm doing my, you know, I do some weight training videos that I put on. I'm always, I tape my wrist still. I love the kettlebell, but it's, it's not something that I really have, have gotten really fluent in. I do the basic kettlebell swing and maybe it's like I'm saying those carries and maybe some some reverse um, dumbbell presses, but I love the kettlebell. I think it's great. I think it's a great great movement. Sarah, okay, is using a barbell. You know, of course, yes. I think using a barbell is safe. But I have to say, I do mostly dumbbell work, and I recommend dumbbell dumbbell work more for people when they're forty and over. And the reason is, that it's kind of hard to understand what I mean. When I talk about like this, like shearing force is good. Shearing force is when like bones are going in two different directions. It puts a little shear force on the joints. And a good example is that you probably will understand pretty easily. Let me show you what I mean. Okay. When you're doing a bench press, right? Your hands are stuck on the bar. That means they can't slide together. They can't come apart. But when you're bench pressing with a barbell, right? Your pec, your pectoral muscle attaches to your sternum, right? Attaches to your clavicle and the outside of your humus, the outside of your arm. So when you're bent, it's called like horizontal adduction. When you're bench pressing, what really wants to happen is your hands want to slide together because that's how the bone is, it, the muscles are pulling your arm bone and they even want to internally rotate your arm a little bit too. But when your hands are fixed on a barbell and you're bench pressing, there's a more of a shearing force in your shoulder. I mean, I, I, you know, I bench pressed my whole life, you know, for 30, 40 years. But the shearing force will be less 
if you have dumbbells where you let your hands come together. And I'm so banged up from so many different sports like right before my kids were born, my kids are like in their early 20s. Me and my wife, we went to, um, I think it was Vail. I pretty much Vail. We went skiing. I, I, I was, uh, you know, snowboarding. I fell, dislocated my shoulder, tore my labrum. My, my wife broke her ankle. It was like a crazy trip. So my shoulder doesn't like a barbell bench press anymore. I mean, I could have had the label fixed and sewn and torn. I never did. I probably should have. But I can dumbbell bench press with no problem. You know, barbell bench pressing bothers me. And even when it comes to like, you know, truthfully, I don't really want to put 225 pounds on the back. My knee probably couldn't tolerate it anyway. I, I like dumbbell squats where I can hold the weight. I, you know, I, I can, you know, I like dumbbell work, you know, for the joints when you get older. Even like a barbell curl, there's the, you know, there's the Q angle and the C angle of your hips and your, and your elbows. A barbell curl is rough on the elbows, I think. When you're in your 20s and 30s, and you know, no big deal, like young elbow, young elbows, you know, can handle things like that. Even like a tricep extension, like the, you know, some people call them skull crushers with the easy curl bar. I'd rather hold dumbbells. I can find, you know, I can find the groove or position when I'm working with dumbbells that is so much easier on my joints that like when people come to my gym, I, I have a synth machines. I may have some older guys and middle-aged guys and gals do some some bench pressing with the, with the barbell, but I do mostly dumbbell work with people. I think it's easier, a lot easier on the joints. But that's just my opinion, but I, I like barbell still. You know, like if I would deadlift, I probably would use a hex bar if I wasn't doing it. Like an RDL, I would do a barbell because, you know, you're working hamstrings. I would probably use a hex bar, you know, the bar that's like the hex shape, so you don't have to lean forward quite as much. A little bit easier on the lower back, I think. You know, that's why I like RDLs if you're 40 and over as opposed to like an American deadlift, you know, type of type of movement. But um, I, I do like it. Oh, oh thanks so much. Uh, congratulations on the 2 million views. Thanks a lot. And I like to get 2 million views on one video. You know, that's the, that's the thing. Okay. Okay, so let's, um, you know, yeah, keep on asking your questions. We're going into Q&A. And I always, you know, how I, I always like to, I always like to show you what I've been eating lately, guys, and gals too. Let me, let me show you some, um, uh, let me show you one of my treat meals that I had this yesterday. I made a video of it. And I've done this before. No, that's the wrong picture. I had sushi uh, yesterday, which I absolutely love. Uh, it's interesting because, okay, I'll tell you what happened too. Back to Italy, my Italy trip. Remember I was in Italy for a couple weeks. I drank way too much wine. I mean, I didn't think I was drinking that much wine there, but you know, you drink wine for lunch, you drink wine for dinner. I was drinking wine like crazy. So when I got back from Italy, I um, didn't drink wine for two weeks. Didn't drink anything for two weeks. And then Friday night, right before this weekend, I said, ah, let me have wine. I had a couple of glasses of wine. And I have to say that wine hit me so hard. I made a YouTube video about this because the wine really made me feel so horrible. That, that, and I'm starting I'm, on Monday. And I, whoever wants to do this with me, you're welcome to join me. I'm going to do a 30-day no alcohol challenge. The video is so far bombed. I don't know why. I thought it was a good video. It was a short video. I tell the story. Didn't do too well. And I'm not going to drink any alcohol for 30 days. But what I'm leading up to this is that I felt a little hungover, so I wound up having sushi, which which I typically wouldn't have. I felt like I wanted some rice, whatever. But I did my resistance starch trick, where I refrigerated the day before. You know, when you refrigerate white rice, it becomes a little bit more of a resistant starch, which is resistant to digestion. You know, which is it becomes like kind of like fiber. So say there's 200 calories of high glycemic carbohydrates in the white rice, if you refrigerate it for 24 hours. You can maybe, I, I'm going to make it up. Maybe you can knock it in half, which is really good. And I love it. I love the sushi. Let's see. Hey, Oliver, thanks for showing up. Hey, Mike. In your video shorts, you always make a point of showcasing fiber in your meals. Why is fiber so important? Yeah, I just love fiber. First of all, a couple of reasons. I think for when it comes to satiety, like feeling satisfied from it, I mean, fiber and protein are, are my two keys. That's why I always, I, you always hear me say, I prioritize protein and fiber. Plus, I just think things good for just digestive health, feeding the good bacteria within your stomach. Like if you eat protein and fiber, you can get away with so many less calories and feel satisfied. That would be the number one reason. Plus, I think it's healthy. People would debate this with me. You get a guy like Paul Saladino, the carnivore guy, or maybe Ken Berry, Dr. Ken Berry, who's another carnivore guy. They said, oh, you don't eat the fiber. From the research that I looked at, I think you do. I think it's really good for you, the fiber. It feeds the good bacteria. It really fills you up. It's really satisfying. Plus, it keeps me regular bowel movement wise with the fiber. If I don't, eat, my my body's so used to eating an avocado every day now. Like if I don't, I get like I I'll get a little constipated or something. So I'm I, I'm a, I'm a fiber guy. I'm definitely in the camp 
a fiber. But I have to say, since I read that new book, um, Toxic Superfoods, I cut back on my oxalates in the last month or two, and I kind of like it. Like I, like the high oxalate foods, which are high fiber foods too, are kind of like um, spinach is like is like a high oxalate food. I kind of stopped doing my celery juice because that was high in oxalates. I stopped eating almonds because they're so high in oxalates. I didn't realize how much oxalates I was getting. Even the beets, I mean, I'll do beetroot powder because there's less oxalates than, than, than eating beets. So I, I cut back on that too. I don't know if that's kind of a side note. I went on a little tangent there, but it might be a little something to the oxalate thing. Let's see, Jeff. This is Jeff. I can definitely join you on the alcohol for 30. Oh, that's great, Jeff. I'd love you to do that. I have no, oh, I, you haven't had alcohol for 30 years old. Cool. I had a few people. Okay, I did this video. Let me, it's interesting because I, I got a guy, I want a client I just love him. He's such a wonderful guy. I've been training him for like 25 years. You know, finance guy, super successful guy. He's going to do it with me. But he brought out some a couple of things. Interesting. When it comes to alcohol, you know, I always like to believe too. Because I like to drink wine from time to time. That you know, a little bit of what red wine is actually good for you. And you know, that's what that's what the research was always showed, right? One glass of wine, for a glass of, one glass of red wine for a woman, maybe two for a man. You know, five ounce normal sized glasses. But it seems like the new research now is saying, you know. No alcohol is good for you. Not even one glass is really not good for you. But I was discussing this with, and I talked about this in the video. And I tried to make the video very, you know, casual, convers you know, conversational. And this guy's a super smart guy. He said, you know, Mike, he, he, what he thinks is is why all these new studies now are coming out like crazy, saying alcohol is no good for you, is because like the THC, you know, these these legal cannabis type companies, that you know, cannabis is going to be legal probably in almost every state before we know it. He thinks that their lobby, they're the ones behind these studies saying that alcohol is no good. But then he also, we, we, we debated it for a while and he agreed that he's going to do it with me too. We're going to go, I'm going to start Monday, no alcohol for 30 days. Well, I only had, an, I had a drink on Friday, so I'll probably have a few more days. And I'm turning 61 in December. So I'm going to go no, no alcohol for 30 days. I'm going to get as many people with me as, as possible to do it. So it could be a kind of fun. We'll like support each other when we're doing it. Okay, let's see Oliver. Okay, thank you for your answer. Second and final question. No, I'll ask as many questions as you want. I'm struggling with some some tendon pain in my elbow, forearm, and rotator cuff. Please, could you advise how I should proceed as I love lifting, lifting weights? Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting because they don't even call, how they call everything now. They call it like tendinopathy. They used to say tendonitis, tendinosis. Tendonitis means like inflammation, right? Tendinosis means you're getting little microscopic tears from the inflammation. Now they call it tendinopathy because it just encompasses everything. I think the best thing you can do is slow eccentrics. I don't know if you've ever seen this thing, this this machine. A guy actually in Westchester, um, I think his name is Dr. Steve Nicholas, whose father, he's actually a knee surgeon, and his father was the the other Nicholas doctor who operated on Joe Namath. Remember when Joe Namath had the bad knees, the quarterback from the Jets? And they invented his, his you know, he has a whole team of guys and gals that work for him. They do rehab, all these different things. They invented this device that you kind of twist it. Have you ever seen it? It's a device where you twist, like you hold this device. I have it in my gym. You twist it, and then you put your wrist in extension. And what I mean by eccentric is like you slowly, slowly come out of extension. I find that for, tendon for tendinopathy, slow eccentric movements are great. So, like you know, if, if you're doing that, inter if you're doing that internal external rotation, those movements, you know, when you hold the band, like say you're going this way, you want to slowly, slowly. You want to let the muscle lengthen under tension extremely slowly, like 10 second eccentrics. I think that really helps. And then mobility movement, you know, the, but the main thing, you just look like a young guy, Alpha, just from your picture. You're probably just hitting it too hard. You're probably just overusing, you know what I mean? You, I, I recently did it, like I, I messed up last summer and everyone here who follows me know, like I said, you know, I'm turning 60, let me really go for it. I worked out too hard. My elbows were hurting me because I get tendonitis in my elbows. Had it on and off for 30 years, and I really hurt my elbows. I got tendonitis in both elbows. Literally, uh, how long is it now? 10 months. They're just starting to feel better now. You know, it took me 10 months. But another thing I do, which I think is good for for your elbows and shoulders too, is that blood flow restriction training. That's what really helped my elbows. I've been doing these slow eccentrics, and then I use those cuffs on my arm and I, I'm curling like 10, 15 pound dumbbells instead of 40s, and you know, instead of like really heavy weight and that really helps too. You know, light rate, weight, high repetition, slow eccentrics, I think are great. I think you'll come right out of it, but don't do things that hurt. You know, I know it's hard and you wanna to go to the gym, whatever hurts, don't do it. 
Let's see what he says. Okay, bicep curls are quite painful for me. Yeah, when I release my grip on the weight, I get a shooting pain in my forearm. I'll put on a few pounds of muscle recently, and I, I know, unfortunately, I, I feel your pain. I know exactly how you feel. Another thing I find when it comes to elbow pain, you know, I got this from Jeff Cavalier. You know, Jeff Athlete X. I'm sure you follow him. You got like a three million. I don't know what he has. Six million followers. He, I, I watched this video a long time ago from him, and it really reminded me that whenever you do your anything that involves a grip, grip with your pinky. Use your pinky. It, it, it distributes the weight evenly throughout your hand. Take a good grip and don't, you know how a lot of people that are into bodybuilding lift weights, like let the weight slide into their fingertips, or don't fully grip, but use the monkey grip all the time. Don't do that. Start doing grip strength with your pinky. Hanging is really popular now, which is a great thing for you to do. I think for your shoulder and your elbow, you hang from a bar, gripping with your pinky. If you can work up to hanging for a couple of minutes, I mean, you can start just with 10 seconds. Work your grip strength. Static, meaning that you don't have to do flexion extension or like statically hold the grip. Squeeze with your pinky and really get the weight in the middle of your hand, not in your fingertips. Like if you're curling, you may not be realizing it, and you're letting the weight slide out of your hand into your fingertips. I see it happen all the time. I'm always telling my clients, you know, keep your wrists up, wrist in neutral. Don't get into a position where your wrist is like this and it's sliding into your hand when you're doing a curl. You might just be breaking down other areas that are, that's putting undue stress on your, on your forearms and shoulders. Grip the weight in the center of your hand when you're doing everything. Your, your back work, even when you're benching and all that, and grip with your pinky, squeeze with your pinky. It's gonna help, that's helped me too. Sometimes I forget myself, you know? Okay, let's see. So I have my sushi, like I'm saying, I got a couple other meals. I made videos on all these meals this week too. I'm, I'm doing a lot of shorts. Okay, this is Olive. Uh, thanks so much for your wisdom. I came across your challenge a few weeks ago, and I'm here a lot. Oh, that's good, good. Thanks, um, thank you for doing an amazing job. Like, no, I appreciate it, Olive. Thanks for showing up too, that's great, that's great. Okay, let's, let me share a couple of my other meals. Typically, I guess, I guess it's kind of boring for you guys if you're here every week. This is just, you know, I've been doing my, obviously, my typical almond, um, um, you know, a, a arugula salad. So I got my arugula, my blueberries, and, you know, I eat like this every single day. I hope people aren't getting tired of some of my lunchtime videos because I eat, do eat the same foods over and over again. I got to start filming my dinners. This one's a little bit different. Like, watermelon's been in season now. Even though it's a little sugary, a little carby, but high in potassium, high in, like I say, watermelon is, is one of the foods that's highest in L-citrulline naturally. And like we say, L-citrulline converts to arginine, which in turn increases nitric oxide. That's another key thing. If you're over 40, your nitric oxide levels go down. That's just a molecule that vasodilates. Great for blood flow, great for a pump. That's what, that's what I put in my pre-workout shakes. Beetroot powder and L-citrulline. So, Eat watermelon and eat, and eat you gotta eat the, the, the rind, like the white part of the watermelon. That's where the L-citrulline is the highest. And then just a typical, I think this was like Arctic chard, some cauliflower, my arugula, which I eat 100 grams of arugula every single day, and my avocado. So I, I don't have too many meals, just, you know, just a few. And that's pretty much it. Let's see, Jeff, okay. Okay, I missed if you said, what do you have in the sushi? Okay, no, well, the sushi, oh, this is what I do with the sushi. I, um, I, when it comes to the sushi, I refrigerate it the day before. And what that does, and so, this is debatable, but I, you know, Dr. I learned this from Dr. Gondria like seven, eight years ago in one of his early books. He's a big believer in resistant starches. Like some foods, a resistant starch, just think it's a starch, like a potato, like rice, that is resistant to digestion. And it almost becomes, it chemically changes and becomes more like fiber, like undigestible type fiber. So when you take, say, two, 300 calories of rice, let's say there's a cup, cup and a half of rice to make the sushi, and I buy this, I put it in the refrigerator, you refrigerate it the day before, it changes, it's kind of hard to explain, but it chemically changes um, the, the white rice and makes it like, like less digestible, more resistant. And I've seen people do this, like there's a couple of guys, there's one of those keto guys, I forget, he's like a handsome guy, I forget his name. He wears that 24-hour blood, uh, blood glucose monitor, and I've, seen, and I've seen him do this. I've seen him take like white rice, cook it, right, and then he'll eat it, and then he'll, he'll, he'll show his blood sugar spike like an hour later, it's like through the roof. Then I've seen him do it where he takes the white rice, refrigerate, refrigerates it for 24 hours, then eats it, 
and then he, he shows you an hour later from the 24-hour glucose monitor, and he gets a blood sugar spike but nowhere near as much. So it's, it's showing that. It really did something to it. Other doctors don't believe so. I know Dr. Ken Berry, who's a low-carb a, a low carb guy on YouTube, really popular. He doesn't believe in that. Some do. He just said, ah, that's nonsense. But I think there's something to it. I, I like it. I almost can tell the difference. I feel like sometimes you eat rice and you're like starving an hour later. When I, when I refrigerate it, I feel like I'm not hungry. I don't know if it's placebo, but... You know, and then it's just salmon and and, and avocado. And I always like to also add an avocado to it because I'm getting more fat, more fiber. That alone lowers the blood sugar response when you're taking in fats and fiber along with the sushi, you know, which is good. Okay, let's see Sarah. Yeah, okay, is dumbbell better than than um, portable? I'm not sure what you mean by that. I'm not sure. Is dumbbell better than barbell? I think so. You know, I think that, okay, I think they're equally as good, but I think when you get older, Sarah, I think it's a little easier on the joints to use dumbbells because you have more f movement. You know, it just takes a little pressure off the joints. Not all movements, but some movements. So I probably prefer dumbbells over barbells when you get older, when it comes to resistance training. This is Melissa, okay. Fixing to break my fast with some blackened flounder and broccoli. Ooh, I love that. That's right up my alley. That's exactly what I would break my fast with, something like that. That sounds good, Melissa. That's great. I like That's perfect. Still at the pool, though. <laughs> I know. That's great. I wish I was at the pool, too. I know. I can't. It's funny. I feel like summer creeped up me. I was in Italy for a couple of weeks, and then I got back. I, I didn't even realize it was, um, what, it was like the, tw I forget what, what, is it the 21st when summer starts? I'm not even sure what day. But it should be good. I love the summer. I love the warm weather. But unfortunately, we have a, a really bad forecast in New York for the next um, 10 days. It's like all rain and clouds. It was a little sunny this morning, but it's already getting pretty cloudy. At least while I am in Westchester, New York now. But I love the summer. Yeah, it's my favorite time of the year by far. I, I just love walking outside. Plus, I feel like, you know, I, you know, when I don't get the vitamin D, whatever, I'm not in as good of a mood in the winter time, just because I think I'm lacking vitamin D. I even take vitamin D maybe in the winter, but I get it naturally in, in, in the uh, summer from the sunlight. Okay, here's Olivia. Olive again. Hey, Mike, sorry for repeating another question, but please, can you talk about maintaining good T levels in your 50s? It's been difficult. Yeah, you know, I, I would say, this. I would say literally the single most important thing is to sleep. You know, like really get eight hours of sleep every night and I know it's and I know it's hard. You know, the cortisol levels, stress hormone levels, you know, your human growth hormone increases when you're sleeping. It's one of the most challenging things for me. I do take melatonin from time to time. I get a really good response with a very low dose of melatonin. Maybe like one, one and a half grams of uh, milligrams of melatonin. Some people take ten. I think you can do three easily. If I do more than three, I'm a little groggy. Cutting back on the alcohol, no question about it. If you're drinking too much, you can really hurt the testosterone levels. Actually, even long, hard workouts can affect testosterone. It seems like if, if your workouts are 60 minutes, 45 minutes, that seems to be ideal. You actually boost testosterone. You start working out hard for more than 60 minutes, it seems to dip. You know, um, testosterone replacement, I know a lot of guys our age do it. I find this kind of weird in testosterone replacement. First of all, is that whoever your, whoever your partner is, I always find that I've seen this happen with my clients over the years is that like maybe say one of my male clients, 60 years old, starts taking testosterone. His wife's around the same age. She's not taking anything. And there's a conflict there because, <laughs> you know, like you really, you know, a, a guy who takes testosterone who's old is going to, you know, it really works. It does work. I and mean, there's pros and cons to it. But you got to be on the same page with your spouse, your wife, your girlfriend, or your partner, whoever that might be if you're older, but I think holistically, there's not too many supplements you can really take. You know, Andrew Huberman, I uh, talk about him all the time. He's the, he, Oliver, I don't know if you check him out, but check out his podcast, the, the uh, Huberman Labs. He's the professor from Stanford. He talks about testosterone a lot. He's had some experts on there, and there really is a couple things you can take, but it's really hard. I think it's more really just quality of life, just getting good sleep, getting good sunlight, eating well, working out all the time, minimizing stress as the best you can, all, all really, common common sense type things um you know another guy who i've been doing some stuff with i think chris knows is is clock i think what how do you pronounce his last name um barkman clock barkman he sees a guy he you know he's been around forever a really great fitness expert he's my age 59 he kind of specializes 
in increasing testosterone for men over 50. So check out everything he says. You know, he's, he's all over this topic like crazy. Let me see who are other people. Even even a Peter T, I would check him out too. That The Harvard doctor, longevity doctor. He talks about testosterone a lot too. And there's another gal, I think her name too, who's kind of specializes in it. But that's my approach. I try to sleep well, minimize alcohol. That's, I'm looking forward to this um, 30 day no alcohol, no alcohol challenge. I wonder if, I'm see, maybe I'll get it, I'll, I'll see a little difference there too in myself. But uh, I, I really work at trying to sleep. And I would do all the things to improve sleep, like I would blacken out your bedroom. That's a big difference. Get that early morning sunlight. You know, work on your circadian rhythm. Go to sleep, wake up the same time every day, right? Eat your meals the same time every day. Like I'm a 16A guy. You know, I generally break my fast with a protein shake around 12. I'm done eating relatively early, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock. Not, not that early, but I 16A. Sometimes I do those essential amino's at 10 to uh, on and off. But work on your circadian rhythm, work on getting good sleep, de-stress. I do that 4, 7, 8 breathing all the time. I love that to de-stress myself. Um, you know, it, it's, all, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy. And then, and then you have to look. I don't know if you had your numbers done. You have to really got to look at free testosterone. I think free should be, what, 1% to 3% of your total. Sometimes people's guys get concerned because they're, maybe their total cholesterol is only, I mean, t- total testosterone is only like four or 500. They'd like it to be eight, 900, but meanwhile, their free testosterone is, 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 is like 5% of their total, which that's great. You know, so it, it's complex, this testosterone thing. I, you know, talk about it with your doctor too, obviously. I'm sure, sure, you know, they probably know more about it than I do. All right, here we go. So we've been going an hour and 20. Any other questions, guys and gals, before I go? I'm probably gonna go take my walk. I'm actually, I don't know why, I'm a little hungry today. I haven't eaten anything. I'm typically not hungry, but well, two o'clock, I haven't eaten yet today. I think I drank a little, little too much espresso today. This is like, I think my fourth cup of espresso. I generally only do two, maybe three. All right, any other, any other questions? I'll give you a minute because I know there's always like a little bit of a lag. Also, I'm assuming the sound was good today because I have a new, I'm using this new interface. So no one said the sound was bad, right? Everything was good with the sound, as good as normal. I'm assuming it is or else someone would have said something. Okay, guys, all right. I'm gonna hit the road. This was great. I like the, today's topic. Also, let me know. Um, any other live streams you want me to do, what topics you want me to talk about. Once again, I, anyone want to join me for this this 30-day alcohol-free challenge, let me know. It'll be great. Just leave a comment under the video. And, and um, thanks for congratulating me for the two, 2 million views. Also, share my channel. You know, give me a thumbs up, all the typical stuff. All right, guys. Thanks, Mo. Thanks for showing up. I really appreciate it. Take care, everyone. This is a good one.